I'm Henrik. I'm in uh, Sweden, <laughs> and uh, um, I work at uh, Mojang doing Minecraft stuff, so uh, gameplay design and uh, um, development, and also uh, team coaching to try to help figure out how to work effectively as, as a group. Um, and in the past, I've done a lot of organizational coaching at product companies, uh, Lego and Spotify and some other companies. Um, so yeah, I, I did a, or virtual me did a talk <laughs> yesterday evening, Swedish time, um, about how we do uh, release management and a bit about how we do design um, for Minecraft releases. Yeah. What about Greg? Yeah. Hey, uh, Greg Bell, I'm the VP Engineering at, at uh, Hootsuite. Um, for those of you that don't know, we are a, uh, a company that builds social media marketing software. Um, we're about a thousand people worldwide, headquartered in Vancouver, Canada. Um, and uh, yeah, I give a talk about, about some of the shifts over the last few years of creating a more um, data-driven culture within our, our engineering team. Uh, look forward to this chat about platforms. Great, and Lindsay? Lindsay, over to you. <laughs> sure. Hey guys, uh, I'm Lindsay Silver. I'm the head of platforms at Condé Nast. Um, and basically I've, I've been a data, data engineer and then an engineering lead for most of my career. Um, and really passionate about how platforms and sort of abstraction layers actually affect businesses. And I think at some point I crossed the line into the dark side of the, the product world um, because I was trying to talk and relate engineering and, and technical concepts to dollars all the time and, and sort of upside. And, and so I'm, I'm excited to be here and, and I'm really looking forward to talking about platform. Great. Um, so I'm just going to jump in while we're waiting for Sierra. Hopefully she can join us. But the first thing, just in relation to this, platform is in the title, but platform can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. So I'd like to just throw it out there. What is your definition of platform? Um, and I'll start with Henrik, because I guess with Minecraft, it might be a little bit um, different compared to, to some of the other answers. Maybe, yeah. Uh, when I first saw the talk of this panel, I was kind of like, well, what, what is platform? Our product is the platform. It's the same thing. But then when I thought about it more deeply, I realized, no, actually, no, um, the, the term platform does make sense in our context because we have this game, right, Minecraft itself, where people are playing. But then the, the product is also a platform because people use... Minecraft kind of like a game engine to build their own stuff on it, mods and all kinds of you know community-driven content. So there those are, in a sense, different types of customers for us, the, the players of the game, and then the people who use the product to build their own things on top of it. I'll hand over to Kiera now um, after, that, after this, but just, Greg, do you want to give uh, an update on what platform is in your context? Yeah. Yeah, there's really, we use that word to, uh, in two major different ways. One, one is um, Hootsuite itself, uh, we consider a, a platform, which means that we have, we have public APIs, we have partners who integrate deeply, uh, and um, we have an app store where customers can buy apps that run within Hootsuite. Um, and, and so that's one aspect of our, our platform. And then, and then we also have an internal platform um, so it's the other way we use the, the term, which, which is, is really we have multiple products all um, in market and we have, uh, we develop um, an underlying platform, technology platform that we utilize to deliver multiple different products. So those are the two different ways that uh, within Hootsuite we, we use that term. Thanks everyone and thanks Greg. Classic case of the computer crashing literally one minute before the presentation, but I'm glad to be <laughs> back on. Um, and Lindsay, did you have a chance to introduce yourself already? I did, yep. Uh-huh. Okay. On to the platform question, and I actually think that Greg and my and in our and Condé Nast view are very similar. Um, that we have a platform as an offering, as a flexible offering, but also as sort of the core underlying technology that powers the portfolio of applications that we have. So on that note, um, you know, thinking about every company wants to be a platform, right? Like you might start with an initial product, but it, you know, it's really about sort of how do we expand, whether that be a marketplace, building applications, or just some kind of internal platform. I'd love to hear from each of you kind of um, how did this, did, did you start as a platform or at what point did you decide, decide we're going to be a platform company? What was kind of like the business driver behind that? Maybe um, Lindsay, could I ask you to 
uh, start on that one? Yeah. I think that we, I mean, we had a, a big shift. So Condon asks if when we think about our platform, the, the cornerstone of the platform is our content management system. So um, we're an editorial company. We have a lot of editors creating content. And so the big piece of technology that we started with, the product that we started with internally was our content, was building a proprietary content management system. Uh, and when I started, which was about five years ago, that was kind of the core product. Um, for us, it was creating, changing, moving into platform thinking was was definitely an explicit choice. And it took a lot of, it was change management internally to get people to go from thinking about one product to, to asking themselves, what could that core product do that we weren't already doing with it? Um, and I think that that fundamentally is one of the big things when you're thinking about a platform is starting from what you have, but asking yourself what other values um, come and, and ours in in our case, the second thing that sort of the impetus for sort of thinking platformizing how we thought was um, was contextual advertising. And so our same core content APIs that then were very editorially driven um, were a lot of content that that editors had put into our systems. Um, if we added things like NLP to those at that point, then we could build an advertising, a set of advertising products on top of those as well. And so sort of organically, um, when we started thinking like that, when we started thinking, okay, this can now, with the same building blocks, we can create another product here. It really changed the culture and the thinking. And I think that's, I think that's where you have to start. Um, I think if you approach it the other way and say, oh, we want to have a platform sort of arbitrarily, um, you get yourself into trouble. And I think you see a lot of end user products that, you know, at, at first are very good and pure, and then all of a sudden have a marketplace on the side and all of a sudden have a community aspect and all of a sudden have these, all these things that are, that aren't the actual purpose of the product. They're just sort of someone saying, okay, we have to find other uses for our brand or other uses for these. Um, so that's how we started it. Now it's gone a long way since then, but, um, but that is definitely sort of how we started our thinking about ourselves as a platform. Yeah, that's great. Um, Henrik or Greg, any anything you'd like to add on this one? Um, well, I guess just from a game perspective, I really agree with the thing that, you know, I can't think of many successful game engines or platforms that were built as an engine from the beginning. And then you add games on top and hope that they're good. <laughs> it's more like you build a great product and then you realize, oh, wait a sec, we could do other stuff with this. And oh, wait, other people can do other stuff with this. And then, and then, and then you have this platform, which is battle tested. Um, so I think that's that's the way it's worked for us with Minecraft and probably most other games I've, I've seen as well. Yeah. And how for, did you... Go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Greg. I, I was just going to say Hootsuite. Hootsuite went through, I, I guess, a you know a, a different but similar uh, journey, which is that um, we build technology for marketing teams and um, and marketing teams uh, have a million and one different pieces of software this day and age that they utilize to get their their jobs done every day. And, uh, and so out of necessity, integrating those tools in a way that um, they can be useful together uh, was just a, a clear opportunity for, for our organization. Um, and, uh, and so, I mean, I guess the other, the other aspect is Hootsuite builds um, software on top of all of the social networks. Social networks uh, have a really long tail of functionality uh, there's a long tail of social networks and a long tail of, of functionality that we may not want to build ourselves and we have chosen not to build ourselves and our APIs allow uh, independent developers uh, or companies to build to build that functionality themselves and have it all integrated into into their day-to-day -day work. And, and that has started happening pretty early on uh, with it as you know, it's about, it's about a 12 year old company now. And so pretty early on that became a core piece of the strategy. It's really interesting. So a lot of different inspirations or reasons for building a platform. I've, you know, I've heard um, sort of on, on the co core content side, like sharing all of the technology that's available in one product. You know, if you have a portfolio of products, enabling them, um, then kind of thinking about what's a marketplace and and uh, Greg and your scenario thinking about yeah the marketing technology is kind of table stakes to be able to to integrate with all that um, very interesting Greg you not only have to think about the you not only have to think about the um, marketing technology but you also have to think about social media um, so. 
and these are companies that are doing things. I mean, so the marketing companies are as well, but social media com companies are doing things, you know, completely independently and are kind of in their own driver's seat. Um, would love to hear, you know, actually from everyone, but maybe we can start with you. How do you plan a roadmap for platform? Yeah. <laughs> given all this. Well, there, there, I'll, I'll try to answer the, the two sides, um, you know, the two different uh, platforms that we kind of talked about, the, the internal platform and then the, um, the external platform. Um, the, so the internal platform, um, I think, is, is uh, fairly, fairly, fairly challenging, um, mainly because we are, we are built on top of uh, just constantly changing APIs with all sorts of different organizations that uh, maybe are uh, some are, are mature software teams that that have great APIs and practices around those APIs, and um, some are new fledgling social networks that may or may not uh, care that much about about their APIs. So the the planning there, I think, is is um, is, sort of, is rather challenging, and we we look for stability. Really, our our internal platform is is actually about guarding our um, our downstream internal teams from all the craziness that happens across all the social network APIs. Um, yeah, and then and then and then uh, similarly, you know, having having been at Hootsuite for a little over five years, uh, spent a lot of cycles um, planning uh, the 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 public APIs that we're going to deliver. Um, th these are, I would I would say, also fairly challenging for us to to create. Um, Roadmaps against mainly, I, I, I believe it's it's more challenging to figure out the value that you're providing to organizations via public APIs than um, than making a user interface. We have tons of great relationships with uh, with customers who we can just speak to directly about, um, hey, you want this button to do this thing? You know, we can build prototypes easily, have customers go through it. We can learn from usability testing, and when we're we're delivering APIs, all of that is more challenging to iterate on. Um, typically, they're kind of large integrations that these APIs are meant for. Uh, th they get built, and then, and then inevitably, you learn some stuff, and you need to make changes. And, and uh, they're, they're expensive to make those changes. And, and downstream developers don't want to make changes. So uh, um, I don't think there's any, I don't have any, any secret sauce uh, in particular. I think we're, we're actively trying to figure out how to better uh, plan and, and product manage our APIs. Um, all, all I could say is that I think they're pretty challenging. Got it, um, Henrik. How about you? How do you, you know, how do you and the team plan a roadmap, sort of for a platform in alignment with all the products? Um, I would say there are a few driving factors, I and mean, we're we're generally quite flexible with roadmaps. We don't generally set up like a five year plan, and you know, it's kind of measure how we follow it is but but we do have high level goals though that we kind of try to align towards and they're driven quite a lot by community because we work quite closely with our player community and creator community and and when we see things that you know that they really need um that makes their life better then that that influences our priorities quite a lot so that, that that's one aspect what, what, what are our creators asking for what do they need um but it's also balanced because every time we build something, we also break stuff for people, right? <laughs> Which is like with any platform. So if we change something, well, somebody, someone somewhere has built something that depends on the thing we changed and not broke. So it's always a trade off. But yeah, so the community drives it. But then there's our own kind of pet peeves like, oh, if we improve this in the platform, it'll make our life easier. If we make this change, it'll be easier to add new entities or add new creatures in Minecraft, for example. Then maybe we should invest in that. So depending on what we're planning in the future, we might kind of, you know, um, prioritize enabling technologies for those features. Um, so things that make our life easier would, of course, influence things. And then the third thing is just what is the, the theme of our next update? So for example, just a few days ago, we announced a theme of the, the next theme for, for Minecraft is going to be mountains and caves. So we're going to build grand mountains and huge cave systems. So of course, then that will influence the priorities of our, of our platform. Like we need to you know, do some things to, to, to enable that to happen. That's, that's cool. I've, I'm sure it would be very interesting just thinking as a designer, like what it would be like to be the cave designer. Um, <laughs> Lindsay would love to hear from you. How do you and your teams um, plan roadmaps? I mean, it's, I, it's hard. I mean, for the reasons that 
that both Greg and Henrik mentioned that when you when we build something, I mean, what we always start with is this really big, obvious problem. And, and with platforms, it's nice because when you do have a new big, obvious problem that you can sort of tie in or, or you can start building, it's it's you've got you've got a place to start. But then those really quickly fractalize. And so as we build roadmaps, usually the first say quarter or first six months of our roadmap are very easy to map out. But as we start getting building a user base, as as the problems start to to get smaller, the upside gets smaller and the number of problems gets bigger, it becomes hard. And I think what Henrik said is really important, which is that you always are both looking for incremental change. And we're, we're even building teams that are focused on incremental change. So we'll have a, a change team that will just be basically improving UIs um, working towards sort of the next iteration or the next version of the software. But we always need to be questioning, is there a breaking change or is there a, a fundamental change to the APIs or to the to the UIs of our products that actually will will make that will solve a problem better in, in a foundational way? And I think people get into one or the other mindset and it's really hard to kind of you have teams that are very focused on how can we disrupt? How can we change? And usually those people are the ones that walk away from a product the minute they've released the first version and sort of <laughs> leave it to die. And then you have people who are incremental change people. And I shouldn't actually say people they're, they're just, there's a mindset that's incremental change and incremental change is easy once you get it, but it's a decreasing marginal value to those changes. And so, you know, so after about a year or two in a product, you've kind of, you're optimizing such minute things that unless you're Google, unless you're seeing a billion clicks per day or something like that, you're not having a huge impact on your and, product. And, and you might even be wasting your time because maybe you're just, you know, incrementally moving towards a local optimum instead of saying, wait a sec, <laughs> you should be getting off this hill and up, up on that mountain instead. <laughs> it's, it's yeah. Hard. And breaking that culture. I mean, getting it. And that's what I, I think that good management, good sort of leaders will always be pushing their teams to pivot one to one side or the other. If they, you know, and that's what a lot of the guidance I give my teams is look, you, you know, if you're thinking incrementally, if you're doing a great job thinking you're incrementally, step back for a second and look for that thing that might fundamentally change your product. Should we rewrite it? Should we do something? Is there something there? And vice versa, if someone I see someone running hard and going toward, you know, going out into left field, coming up with big ideas, you know, I'll often not push them to say, okay, what is your three month roadmap? What is your near term? You know how you know what is what is going to just basically improve your product or incrementally improve it, and that that's hard. I mean, that's something you learn as an engineer. You know, after years of doing it, I think that's I learned that, and I'm sure you guys, both Greg and Henrik, have like you you always have to step back and you always have to balance those two things in your head. So. Thanks, Lindsay. Yeah, it's um, very interesting because as a product manager, often you're always thinking about what's you know what's the roadmap a quarter ahead, two three quarters ahead, and the theme that I've heard across this conversation is a lot of incremental, a lot of feedback from the community. I want to talk about stakeholders for a minute. Um, who do you guys consider the main stakeholders in in the platform? And um, do you do user, do you do UX research on a platform? And have you ever gotten you know negative feedback? I know that this is a lot of questions, but I'm curious, like, what is the day in the life of the in the world with these platform stakeholders? Anyone can. Um, yeah, I, mean, I can talk about our our probably our internal platform. We like many organizations have a have a platform engineering team, and the platform engineering team actually has um, its its management ranks have people who operate as uh, technical product managers, and um, I wouldn't say that we do. Uh, quite quite as rigorous of a job as our, or I know we don't do nearly as rigorous of a job as our, our proper UX research team. Um, however, uh, the version of uh, UX research that we're, we're doing for that is is actually all the other engineering teams. So, you know, the, the, we, I think we have three uh, platform engineering teams of which their customers are the 27 other scrum teams at, at Hootsuite. Um, and so following very similar, I don't, I, you know, we haven't tried to reinvent what product management means and what customer discovery means and what, uh, what, what it means to understand what your customers need. So we've taken a lot of those practices and just pointed it at, um, okay, uh, maybe the problem is more about, well, our engineering teams being effective, our engineering teams um, moving at the pace they can. And if not, then let's look for, for pieces or tools or uh, you know, processes or uh, technology that, that can actually enable most of the teams. Um, so it's kind of from an internal 
perspective. Any other inputs from the panel? Um, yeah, I guess I can me mention who our stakeholders would be. Um, I, I wrote down players, developers, and creators. <laughs> Uh, but I realized that players, people playing the game, they're not maybe the primary customer for the platform stuff. Um, we wouldn't change stuff in the platform for them primarily. Um, we would build features for them, right? <laughs> uh, but th when we do stuff in the platform, it is to make life easier for the developers and designers like me, like so we can work more effectively and get stuff done. And then of course, features that would make creators happy is people who build stuff on top of, on top of the game. But what I, one thing I think is really important when people work with platform stuff and it's very easy to, for, to forget, I kind of want to put it up as a banner on the wall, right? Which is don't forget who you're building this thing for, whatever it is. Cause it's so easy to forget, especially when you're in the platform, it's so easy to fall into this theoretical world where like, oh yeah, we got to make this new structure for our database, but why, who is it for? Uh, and, and is that person, team, function, customer segment, are they involved in the development, giving you feedback? How do you know if you've succeeded with this? Because we tend to build so much junk, right? <laughs> fancy things that nobody's going to need, which just cause entropy in the, in the system. So yeah, we need every single thing we do in a platform to be accompanied with uh, who needs this and, 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 and why. Lindsay, any, anything you want to add? No, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, I agree with both, but, uh, but I think it is interesting when you, for me, the hardest thing was to learn to actually love the products myself so that I was actually my own stakeholder. And, and honestly, when, when one of your products is Vogue, Vogue.com, it takes a little bit of like learning to love it yourself, you know, that, <laughs> but I'll tell you the best products are ones that the, you know, the engineers and the product people love being users of them, wow. you know, and that, you know, I think that's, that's something that our teams that, you know, you just, you find people that love your product and, and you kind of cut out a, a layer and that's really good. I, that's why I love platforms because I can nerd oh, out oh, on it. It can, it, it can <laughs> be dangerous because the engineer writing that feature might love it, but are they the ones who are gonna use it? And right. if they're not, then they might build it unnecessarily. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, that's the difference. And I think that's a really, tr I mean, I know this as an engineer because I've spent months and years writing, you know, hobby projects and things yeah. over and <laughs> over again and trying to tune and trying to make them. There's a difference between loving the code and loving the thing you know that you're creating and then also yeah. loving being being a user of it and that's I, yeah i agree i and that's an easy trap <laughs> to fall into people will say i love you know i love this model because i've created it myself yeah. and <laughs> I'm it myself and next thing we know it's six months later yeah no but the users don't like it but they, they're stupid they don't get it <laughs> right they don't understand it yep that's right that's always what we hear but oh, there is yeah. loving the product too Thank you guys for sharing that insight. I want to uh, I want to just send a quick note to the audience because I think we have about five minutes left. Please send us your questions uh, right now. We'll, we'll start to, to collect them and get them ready. Um, Henrik, you are famous for the MVP approach. Is it possible to do an MVP on a platform? What is that like? So first of all, uh, I didn't come up with the term MVP. Uh, I, I don't know who did, but, and I also don't like the term. I don't use it. <laughs> what I, a term I like better is MLP, minimum lovable. I also like the term minimum testable. So I tend to use those instead because um, I find them more concrete. A product can be minimally testable, not lovable at all, but you can ship it to somebody and get feedback and that's great. Um, and then you have this other state, which is minimum lovable, as in I would actually ship this and be proud of it. it I, I can still improve it forever but it's in a good enough state. So that's why we, we use those um, in pretty much all companies I work with. I've tried to introduce those, those, those concepts. Um, but maybe, um, sorry, I, what was the actual question? <laughs> Is it possible to build an M blank P for a platform? And definitely, what, definitely uh, yes. Definitely yes. Uh, and I would boil it down for, to, to the same thing. If I'm building a platform for something, what is the minimum I can do to be able to test this? Well, build that first and ship it. Because otherwise you don't know if your platform is solving any problem. Um, and then of course, at a later state, you might get to a lovable state and you can have a hundred releases in between, but I find it's useful to have these kind of clear milestones. Um, the reason why I avoid the term MVP is because I've noticed that the term viable means so many different things to people. So it can get very confusing. So maybe the team is like, yeah, this is viable. And then someone else is like, yeah, this is shippable, but wait a sec, the customers hate it. Oh, but it's, it's just the minimum viable. And it gets really confusing. So whatever terms you use, try to make it clear what they actually mean. <laughs> I think there's a necessary that I would I would just throw in, which is if you're building um, a platform for other teams to integrate to, um, 
building that 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 first integration as a part of the design process is, is a, a total necessary. Yeah, I mean, I've just seen too many times the uh, building something with this abstract notion that there's going to be an integration to it, and then when you finally get down to saying, okay, we're going to tie these two business systems together. Oh, the yeah. APIs don't actually support the integration. Yeah, I'll probably use the term minimum minimum integratable product in that case. Like, what is the tiniest yeah. little thing we can do? Ship to somebody, it, even if it's just a you know hello world call to our API, but it's something to check that it works. Um, yeah, I mean, I I think that's the hardest thing we've faced for sure is that minimum whatever you call it product often means go off and build it yourself in a in a silo, you know, to test it. And and what we end up with, I mean, almost every time, and we've had some spectacular disasters that have come out of like let's get really lean and let's build this. But let's not think about the API design. Let's not, you know, right. it's going to take it. It's going to be slower if we try to integrate it into our core at the start. And you know, we've learned a lot about our architecture by you know having to say no, go back first and map out how this integrates with the platform that you've already created. And then you can go out if you want to stub in API endpoints. If you want to kind of create right. a, a version of this that's separate just for time's sake, that's fine. But you better have a plan for how it is integrated. And I like yeah, that. Yeah, that, that's actually another kind of anti-pattern I've noticed when using this kind of MLP, MVP, whatever, incremental thinking, is that yes, we should be shipping in small steps and not building it all and shipping at the end, but we should also have a high level vision, a goal, and not just ship blindly incrementally. So sometimes people get over enthusiastic about Agile, for example, and are like, yeah, we're Agile, we ship in small increments. But you know what, you also need an architecture, you also need a high level long-term goal. It can be high level, it can change, but it needs to be there so you can iterate towards it. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks, guys. I So we have about a minute left. I did want to get to one question from the audience, which is sort of an extension of something we talked about earlier, which is when does an organization, um, organization meaning a company or, you know, part of the part of the engineering and product division, when do they decide to call themselves a platform versus a single product? Maybe you guys have some anecdotes. <laughs> Stumped. Crickets. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I I use those two de two definitions. So I, I I think you know every startup in the world right now is calling themselves a platform. So I think it's it's highly over overused. However, um, I know in in yeah in, in my world we try to use it to mean okay, are we building a platform which is going to have an ecosystem of of integrations or developers around it that are going to build on top of it. Or are we building our internal platform? And those are the only two definitions that uh, that I find myself trying to trying to steer everybody towards. Yeah, I, I I tend to avoid the word because it on its own doesn't mean very much. So instead, try to talk about what are we actually talking about um, instead of using this vague catch-all word. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's such a weird. I think when Greg was describing earlier that you know he both is building a platform sits above a bunch of platforms right in terms of you know what he's doing and probably having having hacked hootsuite's apis a few times myself like i know that people are building platforms on top of you know on top of so you <laughs> sit in this weird world where you're always in the middle of things and so you know everything is a platform and nothing is a platform i think at, at that that point um and you know it's just it, it's a handy thing for us when we're describing a system sort of a factory for other systems i think that's the biggest thing that i would say we we refer to things as platforms if you can build, if you can hang something else off of them or if they're built to be built upon. Um, but I, I totally agree with Henry. <laughs> it's sort of a useless word in itself. It doesn't, you know, anything could be a platform. Yeah. Well, I think we're at time. This has been a great conversation and apologies again for the rocky start, but um, thank you, Greg, Lindsay, Henrik and the UXDX family for having us on today.